I would like to mute. How do I do that? Um, if you go down, like take your mouse down to the bottom of your screen and all the way to the left, you'll see a black and white microphone. Oh, you did it. And my cursor is not working. And so I can't. Oh, no. This happens when I do these. We're live. Okay, well, we will manage. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Julie Briskman. I'm the Algonquian District Supervisor in Loudoun County. Uh, thank you so much for spending some time with us this evening for our public safety town hall. Uh, my office aims to hold a town hall in person or virtually about once a month on topics that you have said you care about. Last month, we hosted one on parks and recreation. Uh, prior to that, we did a town hall uh, on COVID-19 with our health department director, Dr. Goodfriend. And in June, we celebrated Pride Month with our LGBTQ brothers and sisters. We're always looking for ways to bring you information and we welcome suggestions for town halls. Public safety has been a topic much discussed lately on the national, state and local stage, um, especially with the death of George Floyd in Minneapolis and the Black Lives Matter movement. Uh, combined with a bundle of new state legislation that went into effect July 1st of this year and even more that are being uh, brought in special session um, this month. And also the county is considering a voter referendum for a police department for law enforcement. So with all of this going on, we thought it was important to take some time to discuss all of these topics. I'm thrilled to have three very esteemed guests with us this evening. Commonwealth Attorney Buda Biberai was elected to, Loudon's, uh, to Loudon in 2019. She brings a unique qualifications and perspective to this position as she's been practicing law since 1993. As part of her legal experience, she operated a general practice law firm, served as a defense attorney, and as a substitute judge for over 11 years, and as a senior assistant public defender for two years. She's also served as a guardian ad litem, which is close to my heart. My mom does that in Maine as well, uh, representing children and el the elderly in our court system. Now, Buda continues to serve as our chief prosecutor in Loudoun County. I'm also very excited to be joined by State Senators Jennifer Boisco and Barbara Favola. So happy that um, you were able to make it this evening as I'm sure things are very busy at special session in Richmond right now. So thank you so much for taking time. Senator Boisco represents the 33rd district, which includes portions of Algonquian. She also serves on five Senate committees, including two that address issues surrounding criminal justice. Those are the just Judiciary and Rehabilitation and Social Services Committees. Senator Boisco was also recently appointed to the Corrections Compensation Board. Senator Barbara Favola represents Virginia's 31st District, which also includes um, parts of Algonquian and uh, also Arlington and Fairfax counties. Um, Senator Favola serves on committees on agricultural, conservation, natural resources, local government rules, transportation, and chairs the Committee on Rehabilitation, Rehabilitation and Social Services. I also want to assure residents that we did ask for Loudoun County Sheriff's Department representation during this town hall. As early as June 29th, we started exchanging emails and uh, all the way back to even last week, we, re we received a couple of responses that the department was considering a request, but in the end, a representative was not made available. However, once we started talking about all of the potential topics and issues and concerns related to public safety, we decided pretty quickly that um, we may need to do many more of these um, over the next year or so. So to start, I wanna highlight three recent board items that relate to public safety, and then I'll turn it over to our esteemed guests for some updates, and then we'll take questions. Um, first of all, I'd like to talk about um, gun sense. Uh, we lose too many Virginians to gun violence as witnessed in the Virginia Beach mass shooting last year. We're reminded of this senseless violence in our country almost on a daily basis. We know that black and brown citizens are mowed down sometimes just when they're out for a jog as was Ahmaud Arbery in February. This is why I submitted a board member initiative on May 19th asking staff to study three gun sense gun safety measures that will most impact the county. That initiative passed and county staff is bringing re a report back to the board on September 1st. This includes a measure that would allow localities and Loudoun County to regulate firearms in public buildings, parks, recreation centers, and during permanent events. The second establishes extreme risk protection orders, often called ERPO, 
a mechanism by which law enforcement can temporarily separate a person from their firearms because they represent a danger to themselves and or others. The third measure adds public, private, or religious preschools and licensed child care centers to the list of schools where possessing a firearm on school property would be prohibited. So all three of these are rolled into one item and we're expecting a report back to the board and potential motions on these items as early as September 1st. Secondly, um, after the very public and outrageous murder of George Floyd at the hands of Minneapolis law enforcement, we began receiving dozens of emails and phone calls from concerned citizens. Residents want to know, how can we hold law enforcement more accountable so that we work to end systemic racism? They want to know and make sure the appropriate county resources are engaged when a citizen is having a crisis that runs up uh, um, and sorry, excuse me. Thirdly, they want to know um, how we have more transparency in law enforcement activities so that we never have another George Floyd incident, at least in our county. Many constituents have asked also why we don't have a citizen review board or why the Board of Supervisors does not just withhold funding and um, to force law enforcement to be more transparent. So I want citizens to understand that the board hears you and that while many of these seem like common sense ideas and measures, it can't really happen in our county unless we have a police department that's accountable to our county administrator, um, just like the fire and rescue chief is, for example. We fund the um, sheriff's department with uh, citizens' hard-earned tax dollars to the tune of $105 million every year. But right now, we can't demand data, suggest trainings, require HR procedures, or anything like that because the sheriff is an elected constitutional officer and is only elected every four years. So the board decided last month to examine the forms of government that would allow the county to establish a police department with an eye toward having a 2021 voter referendum on the topic. The report is coming back in April of 2021, and that will give our citizenry, citizenry ample time to learn about the pros and cons of having a police department. And lastly, um, in the wake of this year's reckoning over racial disparities in policing, a number of jurisdictions are taking concrete measurable steps, including some endorsed by the Virginia Association of Police Chiefs to address police misconduct. These steps include, but are not limited to, uh, prohibiting no-knock warrants, such as that that resulted in the death of Breonna Taylor, a ban on chokeholds, establishing citizen review boards, funding for law enforcement accreditation, crisis intervention training, and more data collection. So in anticipation of this month's special session, I brought, forth, I brought forward to the board a motion to support the goals of the Virginia Legislative Black Caucus. And these are their overarching six goals. These include holding law enforcement more accountable, strengthening regulation and improving transparency, preventing excessive use of force by law enforcement, replacing law enforcement's role in certain areas with trained specialists and continuing to fight for criminal justice reform and also to pass more COVID-19 relief and pr protections. So we have a number of bills moving through special session that relate to inequities in policing. And I'm looking forward to hearing updates on those initiatives um, from Senator Boisco, from Senator Fapola and Ms. Bibberai. This forum is intended to be respectful and to hold a conversation around public safety issues that impact quality of life for all Loudoun citizens. We will try to answer as many questions as possible over the next hour or so. Questions were submitted via Facebook and also can be submitted during our Facebook Live event right now. Um, however, I want to make sure that everyone watching understands that we aren't going to entertain personal attacks or um, uh, for other people's opinions. So with that, I welcome Buda Bibberai to give us an update. Thank you. Thank you, Julie. I appreciate uh, you having this forum, uh, mostly because it is nice to be able to communicate to our community what is going on so that we also have that transparency and be available for the questions. Um, this is a very timely conversation. As you indicated, we saw a lot of things happen on a national level. And I think from uh, just a humane perspective, we wanna make sure that we never have one of those incidents occurring in Loudoun County. I think all of, the, all of us on this panel can say the following. We are so fortunate living in Loudoun County. 
we've got, obviously by the grace of God, as well as by the people that live in our community, a great community. And what we always wanna do is we want to ensure that and that safety is something that we can all rely upon. Um, I've been asked to mention just a couple of things as to where we are to almost bring a, a current assessment as to where our team is. Right now, uh, from an, uh, the transition aspect, we have traditionally 19 lawyers in our office. We currently have 18. There is one position that is unfilled, and that is my chief deputy position. Uh, I previously had Matthew Snow, who was my chief deputy, and then he took the bench for the General District Court for Loudoun County on May the 1st and that left that position vacant. Uh, what I'm uh, very always interested in doing is I don't fill positions to fill positions. I fill the position with the right person, and we're looking for the right person. So if anybody out there has some recommendations, please, please, please um, let us know, and we'll be glad to investigate that further. Um, we had our transition occurring until about the March time frame, and then, as we all know, COVID hit. COVID has affected our courts in the following manner. One, it has made it absolutely near impossible for us to continue with business as usual in the sense as far as having cases come before the court and having people be given their day in court. Our victims are being left somewhat um, unsatisfied because they can't come to court and get the relief or the resolution that they would otherwise expect. Our accused are also being held uh, in that um, kind of limbo because they also can't have their day in court to be able to establish either that they didn't commit the offense or if they did commit the offense, having a resolution as to what their consequence should be. So our court system really is uh, in, in disarray, not from, from a um, want perspective, but really from the natural consequences of, of COVID. Our juvenile domestic relations court, uh, as well as our general district court, has almost come back to full capacity. Our circuit court, much less so. Uh, we at this time do not have approval from the Virginia Supreme Court for us to have jury trials. Um, that's been obviously a, a major ham hamping of, of what we're doing. So we are in the process of trying to get that approval. I am on that task force. We're hopeful that uh, the Virginia Supreme Court will uh, get our submissions and review them and approve them. But right now, the earliest opportunity that I think anybody's going to be able to get before a jury is going to be towards the end of uh, September. And that's the earliest if we could schedule and have people come in. And then we have to be mindful of people's uh, safety interests. You know, somebody may be fine with coming into a courtroom and being sitting amongst 12 jurors and think it's fine. Somebody else is like, heck no, I'm not coming in there. And, and we just have to be mindful as to how we respect people's uh, own needs. So that's gonna be the other part of the cha uh, challenge. Um, so I know we've got some questions and answers. So what we're going to be able to do is go to that. I can speak more as to what our policies are and our, uh, what we call our guiding principles in our office, but I think I can weave those into the questions so that we don't take time away from the questions and answers. Uh, so I will just go ahead and pass the mic to the next person. Awesome. Thank you so much, Buda. And, uh, I know the courts were already just full as can be until before COVID. So, um, thanks for all your hard work. Uh, Senator Boyska, would you like to give us an update? Okay, can you hear me now? <laughs> my 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 mouse stopped working, so I have to. That would be great when we can have a meeting where you don't have to say, "Can you hear me now?" <laughs> I know. Yeah. I'm that too. So I also, uh, you know, I'm so glad to be here with you and Julie. You've been working hard. I appreciate you. Having a forum so that we can directly have a conversation with the public, I think it's really important that we um, make ourselves available to listen to people. And that's certainly what I've been doing since we got back from Richmond in March. Um, I feel like I'm I'm uh, on Zoom several times a day, making sure that I'm listening and talking with people. I have spent an enormous amount of my time since we've been out of the regular session working with people who have situations surrounding unemployment insurance. And uh, my staff has been working overtime to try to assist people with getting their um, their benefits and going through the maze. It's been really difficult, but we've had a lot of good success. And so that's really a huge amount of work that we've been doing. I also, as you mentioned, have been appointed to the special um, the special ad hoc subcommittee on criminal justice reform. And after the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, our 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 Senate caucus members um, 
got together and said, we are not just doing thoughts and prayers. We're going to do meaningful reform. And we have been working with the chiefs of police, the sheriffs, uh, the state police departments, as well as people in the disabilities community, people who are um, civil rights activists, just a wide range of people with an interest in seeing a change made and making sure that we're not going to have unintended consequences. Um, and so we've got a suite of bills, which you were good enough to lay out for us. And I urge anyone to go to our state website to look at exactly to, I'm not going to go over every one of the bills because they're very complicated and we have several of them. Um, but again, it is common sense practices that we have found in other states have worked. We vetted the, these bills before. We have heard many of them before, and we believe that it's time for us to pass them. I'm carrying two specific bills myself. One, I'm sure people have heard that um, the immigration centers in Farmville specifically that are run by the federal government um, have not had uh, our state folks come in to inspect them. We know that they are rampant with COVID. I, my first understanding was that 75% of the detainees had been diagnosed with COVID. Today, I saw something that said that it's 89%. Hundreds of people are ill and my bill will enable our state health departments to go in and insist on minimum, minimum sanitation standards. Um, and to be able to address the, the rampant illness that not only the detainees are at risk of, but also the people who are working in the prisons um, need to be protected as well. So that's one of the bills that I'm carrying. The second is an earned sentence credit. And I will tell you that 34 other states have a more generous earned sentence credit system than we do in Virginia. Currently, you can earn sentence credit for good behavior and for participating in activities such as getting your education, going to therapy, drug and alcohol um, treatment, um, work treatment, or holding your job. You can get four and a half days per 30 days of good working behavior. The proposal that I bring before the, the General Assembly is for nonviolent offenders so folks like rapists are not eligible for this. I just like to say that out in front. Um, and they would, they would have to follow the rules for a number of years before they would be allowed uh, to, to have their sentences completely reduced. So um, one is they have to, you know, working on education, working on making sure that they are doing all the things that they, they need to be doing. Um, and not causing any troubles. Um, so infractions knock them down and reduce the opportunity for earning credits. Um, this has been seen at the National State Legislators Conference. Conference of State Legislators has done studies on this around the country and has seen that this actually has incidences of reduced recidivism. The people that we're talking about who are eligible for this in the form of the bill that I'm carrying they're all going to get out anyway. 90% of them are, are well on their way to getting out. What this does is incentivizes them to try to earn their, um, their path so that they have redeemed themselves, so that they have um, gotten the skills that will help them be successful once they return to the community. It's also a huge budget saver. We, we in the United States are the largest incarcerators in the world. Um, and here in Virginia, we are above the national average. And so um, this is good. This is good. It has bipartisan support. In fact, Ameri the Americans for Prosperity Group are strong supporters of this and are working with me. Um, and I look forward to seeing um, this evidence-based, well-researched, um, initiative pass. And I am really glad to be here with you tonight. And I'm looking forward to more questions. Um, again, we have a whole comprehensive package of bills that we're going to be carrying um, and have made it through the first hurdle. We had our first uh, Judiciary Committee meeting where a number of our initiatives are moving forward. And, um, and Rehab and Social Services has met twice. We did again today. Uh, 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 
Senator um, Favola is the chair of that committee, and I'm certainly she's going to have some more insight onto these as well. But I thank you for your time and interest, and certainly glad that we're having this dialogue so that people can ask their questions. Thank you so much, Senator Boisco. Um, and yeah, we actually have some recent numbers from the public defender's office that the county um, has saved about three hundred thousand dollars since COVID and allowing folks to you know, go home, be on the, you know, the monitors or something like that, or reduce the sentence just a little bit. And they've been working really hard and the county saved, you know, about $300,000, she said. So it's pretty, pretty amazing. All right, great. Thank you, Senator Boisco. Senator Favola, thank you so much for joining us. I really appreciate it. Please do let us know what's happening in special session that you're working on. Thank you, Julie. I really appreciate you pulling together this town hall and uh, like to say hello to my colleague, uh, Jennifer Boisco and Buddha um, um, Beveridge. Is, did I say your name correctly, Buddha? I think I was close. Um, you got the two Bs. We're good. Okay, great. <laughs> well, you're very kind. Thank you. So a lot's been going on in this very condensed special session. And I think uh, Senator Boisco started to give you a really good overview. Um, we passed out of the Senate Judiciary Committee a major bill on uh, reforming policing. And we took some, I consider them to be very common sense steps. This bill had bipartisan support and yes, it had support from law enforcement. Um, we're gonna prohibit no knock warrants. We're going to prohibit the hiring of officers who have been fired or um, reassigned. We're, we're setting up a, a, a database so uh, jurisdictions can access that database when they're going through hiring. Uh, we have actually set up state requirements for decertification, which is really important. Um, we are going to ban chokeholds and strangleholds, and we're going to require require attempts at de-escalation and require law enforcement to exhaust all other means um, before an aggressive act such as shooting. So there's very much um, an interest in, in, you know, cleaning up the system in a, in, in a way that is constructive, in a way that gives us fair policing, policing that is colorblind, and that really uh, lives up to the standards of, um, of justice and equality. And I, I really feel I've never been as um, hopeful and as um, proud to uh, work on legislation and to, and to be part of a body that is moving forward on transformational change. You know, I do want to note that the culture of policing is not going to change overnight. Uh, it's been years in the making, and it is going to take a little while to to actually change that cu the culture. But we're really working on it. Um, I personally have worked on two pieces of legislation in this area. One was um, reconfiguring uh, or, or reconfiguring the membership of the advisory committee on police training. Because I just think it's incredibly important to start with the concept that perhaps a mental health expert should have input into a curriculum, um, that we should have folks who represent our, um, our poorest def de defenders. So we've got the Indigent Defense Committee on that uh, uh, committee now, and we've got um, the Civil Liberties Union to ensure that police are actually uh, honoring as, to the degree possible the a, a due process model. Um, and then we will have in, uh, representatives from groups that really have uh, suffered some injustices at the hands of uh, police. So I hope that that's a step towards a real long-term transformational change. And we'll see how that goes. Everything is going to require some monitoring. Um, I did co-patron a bill on civilian review boards. 
I know Arlington has one and Fairfax has one, but they, they really don't have any teeth. And uh, we are committed as lawmakers. We're committed to empowering our localities to really come up with a civilian review board that can do the adequate oversight and, uh, and hold police to the accountability standards they should be held to. So there will be an opportunity for civilian review boards, for example, to uh, petition a court to get a subpoena so they can look at disciplinary records, so they can look at uh, trends, they can look at complaints, and they can get a more complete picture of what is going on when an officer is, uh, di is suspended or, uh, or disciplined. So I'm very hopeful about that. I think that's gonna take some work. Um, you know, experts tell us that the, the locality needs to really embrace this and we wanna give the locality every tool we can to, uh, to come up with something meaningful in the way of civilian review boards. Um, the other thing that I personally have spent a lot of time on is developing budget language to support crisis intervention teams I've been working with Senator McClellan on that and um, Senator McPike. Of course, I started a long time ago, so <laughs> so my context, you know, is has is, is been um, developing and evolving as because I've been following this for a couple of years. But but we're very hopeful that the state and I hope we can get the dollars appropriated so there will be money for pilot programs throughout the state where jurisdictions can come up with models that either, and they'll have some latitude here, that either present a co-policing response where a mental health worker and a police officer go out on, on uh, certain calls. So that sort of builds in uh, a de-escalation process because you've got your mental health worker there. And it acknowledges that many times alleged offenders are acting because of some behavioral issue rather than a criminal intent. Um, we're also going to look at mobile crisis units. I know Fairfax has a mobile crisis unit, which can be called 24-7. Um, there are other models out there on crisis intervention. And as long as the model is evidence-based, and a community is committed to implementing it in a way where they can actually provide follow-up to the offender, where there's some community-based service in there, where there's um, an acknowledgement by police that, that uh, the mental health part of policing will be valued and used, um, the state will be open um, to funding these kinds of programs. And I know I, I've heard from our um, it's the Department of Behavioral Health and Developmental Services working in collaboration with the Department of Criminal Justice Services. I think the Behavioral Health Services would actually be the conduit for the money. Um, so we're hoping that that we get some good applications and, um, and we'll see. So that's where I've personally been working my committee, <laughs> Rehab and Social Services. Here's bills that are actually related to the criminal justice reform piece of the conversation. So uh, Senator Boisco's uh, credit sentencing bill came through uh, my committee, our committee, she sits on that committee. Uh, we, uh, we're looking at different parole bills and uh, we heard a couple th this afternoon. Um, so we very much want to, I think, embrace the, the rehabilitative context of the criminal justice uh, system, and um, and invest money in in ensuring that individuals, when they're released, have the tools to actually integrate into our community. We can reduce recidivism, and um, and we can actually make our community safer. I think the point, you know, I mean, ninety-seven percent of our offenders are in fact going to be released into the communities. And we need to acknowledge that fact, and we need to um, we need to address that fact in a way that is constructive and helpful, and safe. Um, I, I love that. I'm sorry. I, for one, would like to see some more money invested into our um, 
in, in, into areas that will develop trust between the police and the community, and also into early childhood education, into K through 12, into some of the areas that really, you know, can stop the prison to fight the, the uh, school to pipeline, school yeah. to pipeline rather early. That, that's you a, really want me to be quiet, and I will, and I'm happy to take questions. That's a, thank you so much. I appreciate that. Um, I, I love the idea that you're you're remaking the committees to a certain extent because something happened when I first took office, and that was um, we realized that, and I realized that you know it's the information you're getting from committee is only so good as the people sitting on the committee, and you know if it's not a well-rounded committee. There may be holes that you're missing. There may, you know, so we actually had to, you know, have votes and and kind of change the process a little bit when we were making our committees at the beginning of our terms. Um, and uh, it's so important, like I said, to have have those folks. And then so important just to go through the process. Um, I just wanted to um, make sure that everybody understands in the county that anytime we're considering any sort of major changes like this, that we have, you know, a public hearing. We have folks can come and speak to the board uh, and now during COVID, you can come and speak in person and you can come and you can do it uh, like we're doing this right now. So there's all kinds of opportunity for public input moving forward. Some of the things that you mentioned that you're looking to pass and, and I'd like to ask you to this kind of about the July laws, but um, the things that you said about. Um, uh, restricting chokeholds, um, making sure that, you know, force is a last resort and those sorts of things. Given that I think you might correct me if I'm wrong, but something like 95 of the counties in Virginia have sheriff's departments versus police departments. That's correct. Hey, do, will those laws also apply? And then in turn, um, how, how do we hold them accountable in the end? And that might be a beauty question. But can you answer that, Senator Favola? Like, if, if it would okay. apply to our sheriffs? Yeah. Um, the way the statutes were written, and again, the, it, things just got voted out of judiciary. So it is possible through the legislative process there may be changes. But the codes that were amended were law enforcement codes. So, in, so where the sheriffs are actually enforcing the law, they would be under those law enforcement codes. Um, so okay. that, that is the expectation. Okay, that makes sense. I would just like to point out, we worked very, very closely with the Sheriff's Association and with the police chiefs across the state to make sure that we were getting um, policy that's not gonna have unintended consequences. And so, okay. you know, I sat down with our sheriff here in Loudoun County, but also the chief of police in the town of Herndon for hours to talk about these kinds of things to make sure that we were getting their input. And I think it's because of that, we have been working so hard to, to collaborate that we have a really good product here and good good policy that we're gonna be putting forward. That's that's great, that's really good to hear. Um, Buda, that, so, Sometimes, Buda, I feel when we're talking about all this, we're just making your job uh, <laughs> maybe bigger in some ways, but more difficult. Although I don't know, I don't know how that can be possible. But could you could you speak a little bit, uh, kind of winding back to the things that I spoke about at the beginning, the new laws from that went to effect July first that the county is considering? Could you speak a little bit to those, like for example, the ERPOs um, and how that might impact the county and who might be most affected by those? And then if you have any comments about the, the new legislation that's coming out, I, we'd love to hear it. Okay, so now do you have to be mindful of this. Um, I am a lawyer, I can talk all day. So I'm gonna try and answer all those questions, but be very uh, 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 mindful about my time. So at any point in time, if you wanna just cut me off, just let me know. Well, so let me go back. Thank you. So let me go back to some of the things that you ended up uh, speaking about is the things that uh, the county's trying to deal with as far as our extreme risk protective orders. And what that is really intended to do, and, and we've had uh, individuals talk about how, how they have self-reported, but they've had uh, thoughts of harming themselves or maybe someone else, and they have actually called and self-surrendered uh, their weapons. That probably would be the most perfect example to talk about how that law is intended to work. You may get somebody speaking about the fact that somebody's trying to take somebody's guns away or stop them from having guns. 
Honestly, no. What we're trying to do is this. Keep guns away from people who are, at that point in time, not safe to have guns. Right. It protects them, and it protects the community. Uh, I will tell you this. Since coming into office, uh, I get the medical examiner's reports regularly in those individuals uh, who pass away from certain uh, non-medical uh, uh, bases. The majority of the suicides that we have are one of two things. Guns, self-inflicted wounds, or uh, drugs. Yes. And that's why we need to figure out is just how to be smart. And when you talk about gun sets, just being smart about these things. That's uh, so on that issue. The public and private preschools prohibiting possession of guns. Um, when we start thinking about SROs and why we think they should be in our school system is because we want them to save our kids in the event somebody wants to harm them. Well, if we can have some controls that somebody can't bring a gun onto the property to begin with, I think maybe that way do is it might dissuade somebody from having that thought to begin with. Uh, so that's, you know, again, where we're trying to put in those safety measures and the protections in uh, for our community, especially our, our young kids. Um, and I apologize, the third thing that you were talking about was our, um, well, within also with the public buildings. public buildings. Yeah, within the public buildings. That is similar. Um, this is a situation where it's just like drinking. You could drink in certain places and it's not a problem. You just, you can't, you shouldn't be drinking everywhere. Same thing with guns. You can have a gun someplace, but it shouldn't be everywhere. You know, that's, that's the part that we just have to be mindful. Rules are intended to try to minimize or maybe somehow or another uh, close that wide impact that uh, dangers could come into our communities. I'll, hey, I'll Adrian, share one. Yes, go I'm going to have you. I'm going to have you pause right there because we did have a question about SROs. So before you go on to the new legislation, um, okay. we had a question about. Um, let's see, removing SROs and how would that make our schools safer? Um, and so I, I just wanted to point out that we. Uh, we did, I argued against having SROs in our um, elementary schools. Uh, I just don't think that's appropriate. Um, and we do know that, you know, across the country, the SROs really have never saved anybody's life. In the same, in the same extent, like having a gun in a public building, it's very rare that that person would actually save somebody's life. And then there's the whole racial inequities thing with the SROs, right? So a recent study said 28 states, the share of arrested students who are black is at least 10% points higher than those um, of, of others. And uh, in 10 of those states, the gap is up to 20%. And in Virginia alone, black students make up 39% of the population in this enrollment in the public schools. Um, but they have with one at least one arrest. Seventy five percent of them are are African American or Black students. So that's sort of you know where I am coming on the on the SRO situation. Julie, uh, Julie, I think I can um, maybe add some context here. Um, that has been a very the the state funding of SROs has been an issue that myself, Senator Boisco, and others have heard from the community. I'm of the opinion the state should not continue to fund SROs, but the decision to have SROs will still rest with the jurisdictions. So if localities decide that they want to have SROs, then they will have to fund them completely and work on the M memorandum of understanding and, and all of that. But um, that's very interesting. That's yeah. very interesting. So, I mean, the only role of the state right now is in the funding of it. And of course, we did. When I was chair of the Commission on Youth, we did actually change the training curriculum for SROs and we brought in cultural sensitivity and, you know, by a racial biased training and all that. But we still don't have a good uh, we, we don't have ways of really overseeing exactly how the SROs are working in the different schools. And we've heard, I personally have heard some very positive stories, but I've heard some very disturbing stories. Mm -hmm. So I would rather not give the state a, a role and allow the local governments to take that on. That is, um, well, and, and the lack of funding will probably um, 
have an impact, I, I would, I would but, imagine. <laughs> but we're not putting that much money. We're actually not putting that much money on the table. Oh, okay. Yeah, I mean, we're not. But, um, we don't have a big funding role, and the local governments, Loud and Fairfax, Arlington, and the Nova governments up here are not getting much money at all from the state. Oh, gotcha. Yeah. Well, and and the other, uh, so so two things to that point, and then I'm I'm sorry, Beta, we'll we'll move on. Um, in speaking with my school counterparts, you know, the schools are the ones that we we often, this board often has said, you know, well, what do the schools want? And the schools will say, we don't want them to leave. But when you dig a little deeper into that, they really want the extra set of hands around. You know, when you really start asking, and that comes down to funding our schools and that whole other domino effect to making sure that we're using our funds appropriately, also on the school side, they're saying, well, we, we, if we do have them, we really want to be more involved in the training and what, and what they're doing. Um, and, you know, to me, when they, when they told us on the board, like everything that they're doing to educate the children, it's phenomenal. I mean, it's good. It's, it's a, it's an interesting program. It has a lot of good points, but my first question was, well, do you really need a gun to do all of that? Do you really need a gun on your side and ability club on your side to be teaching those things to the kids? I think I, I think the there um, and I, Senator Boisco, I, I, I think uh, certainly voted for this. We need to fund um, more counselors, and we could shift that money into the funding of counselors, which would make a more meaningful difference in our school systems. Um, you know, they have behavioral interventionists, and there are a whole range of titles that fall under the category of counselors, but. That would be a better use of our money is if we could really enable schools to reduce the ratio of counselors to students and give you the extra hand for people who really understand the developmental issues kids are going through. And Loudoun County is getting much better at that. So, um, yes. so beautiful. Oh, go ahead, Senator Fogel. I'm sorry, Senator Boisco. I was just going to say, we also passed a legislation that takes the discipline responsibility away from the SROs. So it's fully in the hands of the principals, which I think is a good thing for all the kids and for, you know, the schools. So that that's moving us in the right track of, of stopping the pipeline to prison. Right. Yuta, I'm so sorry I cut you off because I just wanted, we did have some questions on SROs, so I wanted to address those since you brought it up. Any other comments on the SROs and or comments on, on new laws coming down the pipe? Uh, yes, so if we could stick with uh, what uh, Senator Spavola and uh, Boisco were saying, uh, I think one of the best things that um, the General Assembly is passing is the fact that there's going to be a requirement for data collection. Mm -hmm. So that if somebody is being disciplined and how they're being disciplined, now you have a record for Because remember, we talk about transparency. Everybody's got an anecdotal story say talking about how, you know, this part of the process is the worst thing in the world versus this part of the process being the best. They're both right. But it's a matter of like when we look at it from a global perspective, you know, really what is in the best interest of our community? Um, Loudoun County has had SROs in the school system now for, I don't want to know, I want to say maybe 15 plus years, maybe 20. I don't remember a time when we didn't have them, um, but I don't want to mistake the time. And I'll tell you, when I, as a defense attorney, I was regularly appearing before the school board on school disciplinary hearings where they would uh, eject kids from school, expel them for some minor behavioral things because there's zero policy, right? Zero tolerance policy. And a lot of times the school resource office, uh, the school resource officer was the one who was in charge of the discipline. So they had that that uh, default for the school teachers and everybody else. Anybody who got out of line kind of got referred to it, then they got referred to the uh, courts. That's hence the epitome of the school to prison pipeline. Now with the laws changing, and there's another law that came post where the school is charged with creating a discipline process in house. Mm -hmm. So that if you have those school misbehaviors, we're not sending them to the courts. We're not sending them to our juvenile court services unit. We are going to actually take care of it inside the school, where it should be. And then if there's a an opportunity to divert the, the child, then that's what happens. They have consequences. So remember, when we have these conversations, don't let anybody na hijack or steal our narrative that all of a sudden there's no accountability. There is accountability. But not everybody needs to go through the daggone courts and go to juvenile detention center or things of that nature. We have tools available that are better than that. 
that allow these kids to come back and stay in the school. And then also they're rooted. And guess what? They make better, more successful adults. And that's what we're looking for. Um, so all these laws and these changes are, are amazing. That's what we want to be able to do. Um, and the last thing I'm going to say is that they've taken out this catch-all law that has been used for forever as far as disorderly conduct for a kid. And it traps everything. The General Assembly has put in there that that does not apply to school misbehaviors. And I think that's going to change the culture that we have as far as worrying about how our kids are being maybe diverted away from school. So I applaud our uh, senators and thank you very much for being part of that. And Julie, go ahead and ask another question because otherwise I'll be here till tomorrow. So I apologize. <laughs> Thank you, Vita. Um, we did, uh, Vita, have a question about jails and the jail. Um, and the question is, are people currently held in jail who have not been convicted? And I'm sure you can hear on that a little bit. So again, what time are we done with this conversation? <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, uh, now, I'll have to tell you this, with COVID, um, these percentages might be off. Because during COVID, we have actually decreased by a considerable percentage the individuals that we're holding uh, in our uh, jails. But a lot of times, the local jails, the majority of the inmates are actually pretrial. So that means they haven't, they've been accused, but they have not gone to trial and been uh, assessed as to whether or not being guilty or, uh, of an offense. So traditionally, the majority of the individuals who are in a local facility are being held pretrial. And what we did is uh, we made it very clear with our courts that we are not asking for cash bonds because then it becomes a situation where it's a financial uh, trap. Where if somebody can afford to post a bond, they get to go out in the community, keep a job, keep their house, keep their family. If they can't afford it, well, it kind of sucks for you because you get to stay in jail and you lose your house and you lose your family and you lose your job. And then we talk about instability. That's where we get the recidivism and the problems. So we just have to be smarter as to how we're approaching these things. We need to have accountability, but we don't need to have to break somebody and make them make it impossible for them to be engaged in our community and be successful. That that just is not the right way to do it. Thank you. Whoops, am I on? Yes, I am. Thank you. Thank you for that. Do would either of the senators have any comment on that? I don't know if you've dealt with legislation on that recently or in the past. Um we're looking at some of the pre-trial uh, procedures, but that's that's really in the weeds. And okay, <laughs> we would be turning to our Commonwealth attorneys to to get advice on that. And uh, you know, whenever you're legislating in areas where the practice of law is so fine-tuned on a case-by-case -case basis, we try to act uh, judiciously <laughs> and, and and slowly. We want to talk to all of our stakeholders because no matter what solution we come up with somebody's had a case where <laughs> the solution right, right. Is work. <laughs> okay um I, I, I just add a little bit i mean that kind of fits into the whole giving more autonomy to prosecutors and and our j judges to make decisions based on facts and um and you know reasonable situations so that they can make the best decisions to make a safe, but also to eliminate the kind of thing that that Buda is just talking about, um, and and I think that's really important. I mean, what we've done over, since the '90s is we have really amped up our criminal system, right? And with um, mandatory forcing charges on certain people, and and as I said, we we incarcerate more people than anyone in the entire world. And in Virginia, we are above the average. So these these efforts that we're making, which were inspired by the death of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, we decided in the Senate to look holistically at the whole range of our, our judicial system and our criminal justice system so that we're thinking thoughtfully, evidence-based, reasonable, things that we think need to be changed to try to make the system fairer um, for everyone. Um, yeah, and to that point, um, we do have a bill that's uh, going through the process now, which would enhance the court's ability to expunge charges for dismissed charges, uh, for uh, substance convictions, and for pardon defenses. 
So, you know, that's another piece of this sort of criminal sure. justice reform. And I know my Commonwealth attorney, um, Parissa Tafty, would be very interested in having the ability to, you know, reduce charges uh, or to uh, dismiss charges right in front of the judge with at her discretion without um, uh, some of the the restrictive um, language that's currently in law. So we're we're looking at that as well. Okay, that's that's wow. You guys are busy. <laughs> um, wow, uh, I do have a couple of questions uh, related to the sheriff's department, Buda. I don't know if you can answer this, and I know we have a comment about the disciplinary panels as well that you might want to address, but. The question about the sheriff's department is, um, do you feel the sheriff's department is prepared to um, uh, enact, enact isn't the right word, to um, implement the ERPOs? Do we think that the county's prepared when that goes into effect or are we doing it already? Uh, that, that's such a uh, tough question for this reason. When you say prepared, um, I, 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 I trust that they are. Right, because this is something that they are uh, trained to do, and be dealing with those types of scenarios in a different setting. But um, I, I will say this to you that that statute is very concerning because where it's different is normally our law enforcement get a call, and they are responding in in a situation that is occurring in, in sort of a crisis. Here, what ends up happening is they are they are uh, provided an order. And they've been told, hey, by the way, this person has been ordered to surrender their guns. They have not. Now we want you to go to their house and go get them. That to me just really actually terrifies me. Mm -hmm. Because if we have somebody who is not in a situation who is um, of the, the right mindset to have these guns, and now we're sending our law enforcement in to go get them, it is. It's just, I don't know what the best response is because obviously it's a necessity. Uh, but stuff like that always worries me because then if somebody knows that they had an order issued against them and I haven't surrendered the guns and I know that the cops can come to my house, you know, within so much time and come get them, am I then setting myself up to some sort of, of, a, of an ambush or I don't know. So in my mind, my mind works all of a sudden. I try to anticipate all of the bad case scenarios to figure out is how do we anticipate. Uh, but the short answer to your question is I, I, I think that our law enforcement is, is prepared and, and trained to be able to um, deal with the ERPAs. So, yes. Okay. Okay. Great. Um, yeah. And we, we do know that the domestic situations are the ones where officers get injured. I mean, a, a sheriff's deputy friend of mine was injured um, early 2018, I believe it was. You know, this, um, re, re, discussing domestic situations, there's some, um, I serve on the sexual assault advisory committee and I chaired that committee for a few years. This is the state committee. Uh, there's an assessment, a lethal assessment now that's being developed by some expert advocacy groups to sort of determine if, in fact, the firearm, uh, you know, should be removed or to, to um, how shall I put it, to uh, document, to create documentation should the herbal law uh, need to go into effect. So that's an interesting piece of the puzzle. Um, and then there's also a, a conversation going on about whether, you know, a counselor should also go out on these domestic violence calls, which because you also have, you know, a survivor who may need the support of, yeah. you know, a professional. So I just wanted to alert you that these conversations are going on, um, but there's nothing. They're not they're not legislative proposals. They're just out there, you know. <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I am interested to, to see if we can resolve some of this by using our mental health professionals in those crisis situations um, where, you know, they they are probably the best to be responding. And I know that's complicated and I know that it's going to take a lot of work um, and nobody wants to defund the police. We want to make sure that we're using our resources in the best way possible to keep everybody as safe as they can be and as healthy as they can be. Can you guys stay on just a little bit past eight? Yeah, please. Okay. All right. I want to address like two questions we had about the sheriff's department, if you're okay with that, and then just give everyone an opportunity to, to close up. So, um, we had a question about, um, 
what are the benefits to both the community and law enforcement provided by having a police department model versus a sheriff's department model in the county? Um, first of all, I'll say that um, the sheriff's department would really never go away. Um, we will always have an elected sheriff. And the thing that we are thinking about doing, which many of the counties in the state have done that have grown to the size of Loudoun County, and in fact, the, Loudoun, uh, sorry, the, the sheriff's association across the nation has said, if you've had expen exponential growth in your county, you might want to consider a police department. That's like one of the two reasons that sheriff's association actually said you should look at it. Um, but we will never lose our sheriff and we'll always be able to elect our sheriff because they run the jails and, and the courts and all of that. But um, some of the uh, things that we might want to think about when we're talking about the pros and cons right now, the, the standards for being a sheriff are really that you have to be of legal age, have a high school diploma or GE, GED, or live in the county. And those are like the only requirements to having to being elected sheriff. And so the thought might be in a county such as ours, we might want to have a national search for um, a sheriff and then have that sheriff hired by um, the county. Um, right now, uh, the county cannot require any, you know, like I said, HR procedures. Um, we would be able to institute, you know, the citizen review board that you guys are talking about. We might have, um, be able to ask for data such as the racial makeup of those who are pulled over. So we don't have racial profiling. So right now, under the model that we have right now, we don't really have those sorts of procedures in place, or we and we can't even ask for them, even though we are funding the sheriff's department at 105 million dollars a year. And that also helps the deputies because they would have a HR process to go through and more more regulations for hiring and that sort of thing. Um, Julie, uh, um, this Barbara. Um, even if you had a police department, the sheriffs are constitutional officers. Mm -hmm. So according to our current statutes, the sheriff would be elected unless we change the laws. So, so uh, Loudon doesn't have the option of just having the sheriff report to a county manager, or, you know, it's part of the constitutional officer model and that's throughout the state. So, um, and I would expect there'd be a fair amount of pushback on that, on that model. I just wanted to be clear that you could. Yes, I think there would be a lot of pushback on that model. And I think that the citizens should, should have that opportunity to, to elect their sheriff. Um, and then the other question, I'm sorry, it wasn't about uh, the sheriff's department. It was, uh, no, it was, it was what steps can the BOS board of supervisors take to examine racial bias in law enforcement in the county, including schools. Um, as far as schools go, I know that the school board and, and the school system operates on a whole nother <laughs> playing field, so to speak. Yeah. But yeah. as far as the board, we actually cannot. Um, we can't, we have never seen necessarily a study that shows us the racial makeup of our deputies. I do know that the nine top officers in the sheriff's department are, are, are older white males. So, um, but we don't know. And so that's another thing that I think would be a benefit to the community if we could actually examine the, the, the makeup of the deputies so that we have it more balanced compared to what, what we might have now. But we just don't know is the answer to that question. So uh, those were the two um, questions that I, I wanted to follow up on that we had gotten. I, we've gotten a lot more and we'll have to go through all of our questions. I think there's comments flying on Facebook. I'm getting some texts from my staff. I think I've covered as many as we can in this time, but um, and we will have to do this again, especially as you know the special session ends. There'll be a lot more to talk about then too. <laughs> um, so I really appreciate your time. I wanted to give you each an opportunity, maybe one or two minutes, if there's something that we talked about that sparked something that you wanted to say and you didn't get to, or if there's anything else you'd like to say in closing. And we'll go in the same order. Go ahead, Buda. Thank you. <clears throat> and I kind of am treating this in part, maybe like we could focus on the, um, uh, what we talked about as far as the schools of prison pipeline. And I know that there was a comment uh, made on the Facebook thread indicated that uh, I had, I, I didn't do any of those hearings. And I'll tell you this, uh, I did because there was an incident out of Tuskies 
where we had a couple of the uh, board of supervisors, I'm sorry, the school board members who are not on the school board anymore, but that commenter uh, was on that uh, panel. And we were able to establish that the juvenile was accused of a very significant uh, crime. And once law enforcement further investigated it and the prosecutor's office at that time determined that there was not a crime. But nobody went back to correct that with the, with the school and that juvenile was out for five months without there being a valid reason to do so. So that's why, it, for me, I would suggest this from a community perspective, we all need to work together because we want to come up with the right answer. We can't just react. We have to be responsive. And this is why when we start talking about criminal justice reform, uh, you know, people try to spin that into saying that we're trying to be light on crime. No, we're trying to be right on crime. You know, those individuals who are violent and who are creating a great home to our community, we take every effort and we make sure that all of our resources are in that direction so that we are holding those individuals accountable and we're keeping our community safe. And if they have to be excised and excused from the community, then that's what happens. Individuals who are on the other end of the spectrum who are, are making uh, decisions that are low impact or, or non-violent, then we shouldn't be taking those resources and putting it in there because at the end of the day, a dollar is a dollar. All we have is the money that we have and the human resources that we have. We can't unnecessarily waste them. So we're going to make some things, some big changes in, in how we uh, prosecute cases in Loudoun County. But I'll tell you this, that we are very committed to making sure that the safety of our community is never jeopardized. And we have to focus on those big resources and the big issues rather than things that are what we would call uh, kind of your, your more incidental uh, bad decisions. But uh, that is the commitment we make to our community, safety and justice hand in hand. Thank you, Beauta. And boy, five months out of school, I mean, that can start the spiral right there. That's really, that's really a shame. I'd like to talk to you a little bit more about that offline. Um, thank you so much, Beauta, for joining us. Uh, Senator Boisco, anything to wrap up? Yeah, one of the things that we didn't really spend very much time on, but I've spent an enormous amount of time is really around our uh, community of individuals with disabilities, with developmental and intellectual disabilities who have been caught up in the uh, criminal justice system um, really inadvertently. And one of the things that we have done is, is worked hand in hand with the members of the ARC of uh, Loudoun County and in all of Virginia to talk about ways that we can help protect and empower um, those family members to help their, their loved ones, um, as well as to make sure that police are appropriately responding to people who may have disabilities. So one of the things was we've passed legislation recently that would allow you to have a designation on your driver's license to say, right. I have autism. So that if a person is not uh, approaching with eye contact or acts a little bit um, um, less responsive than they're, they're being requested to, there's some understanding. We also have some legislative initiatives that would help. So like there's, there are stories of, 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 of individuals with developmental disabilities who have spitting issues, for instance, and can't control themselves. I don't know if you know, but you could be charged with a, a assault on a, an officer for spitting or throwing a, a French fry or an onion ring or spilling water on them. Again, we have a legislative initiative that will help provide some context so that they automatically do not get charged with a felony, um, but could more examine what's going on. I think it's really important that we look at people who don't have a voice. And that's one of the things that I've been working on for years um, with people with mental health challenges, our immigrant community, people with uh, disabilities, because they often don't have an ally yeah. to come and stand up for them. And so as we are considering all of these proposals, I think it's important that we're not just looking at people who look and act just like me or my family, but we're looking at everyone. Um, and we know that black and brown individuals have been incarcerated at a much higher rate. I think the, the population of Virginia is about 19% African-Americans, yet they're more than half 
of the population that have interactions with our criminal justice system. We think that there are some challenges, you know, people use marijuana the same way. However, it's the black and brown individuals who end up getting charged with those crimes. And so we're looking holistically at what we can do to, to one, be responsible and make sure that we're, we're, we're holding people who are dangerous accountable and protecting our, our communities. But we're also looking at where we're making mistakes and trying to trying to improve on those areas. And I'm so glad that you are having this event tonight and I look forward to continuing this conversation because it's gonna be continuing and um, just appreciate the public for being part of this. Thank so you, thank you so much. And actually those, those numbers you're talking about um, in Loudoun County, we have 7.5% of the population is African-American and 33% of our jail population is African-American. So, you know, if we'd like to think that we live in a community where that doesn't happen, but numbers don't lie, wow. you know, so it's, it's unfortunate and I really appreciate all of your work and I miss you guys. <laughs> all right, Senator Favola, do you have a minute or a little bit more sure. minute or two? To oh, well, I, I will just say, uh, and, uh, thank you to my colleagues. You're both doing awesome work. Um, and thank you, Julie, for there's nothing like local government. I've been there 14 years, nothing like it. So yeah, you, you can hear me, right? So you guys are doing a great job. But I, I will just say that we have to start really attacking the systemic uh, poverty issues that have really, really fed into the racism. I mean, when you have for every nickel an African-American has in his pocket, a white person has a dollar on average. So we've, I mean, at the end of the day, we've got to ensure that our housing policies are truly fair. We have to ensure that every child gets a quality education. We have to ensure that access to health care is a true reality. So there are some real systemic things that we're trying to, to deal with. And, uh, and I hope we succeed. It's just going to take some time. But with the community pulling together, we will in fact create a more perfect union. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. And I hear you on all of those topics, especially the housing, the housing one, yeah. Loudoun County. So we're going to, need to work really hard on that. Well, uh, uh, Senator, Senator and Commonwealth's attorney, um, thank you so much. And let's talk some more. Let's do this again. I really appreciate your time and your knowledge. I mean, you ladies just have so much to give and you're working so hard and I really appreciate it. And I will talk to you soon. I hope in person. <laughs> Bye, thank you. Have a good, good night, everybody. Bye. Thank you. Good night. Thank you all. Good.